This is known as the Chinese Linking Ring. It has 2,000 years of history. It's known as one of the greatest pieces of conjuring in the history of magic. I spent my entire life mastering this piece. <laughs> but I don't feel like doing that today. <laughs> Instead, let's start the talk. Hello, everyone. It is an honor to be here to be able to speak for all of you today. My name is... Ma My name is Will. It's lovely to be here to speak for all of you. A little brief introduction about myself. I started doing magic at age of 12 after witnessing David Copperfield perform on TV. And then I moved to a different country, a big country uh, called Canada, <laughs> which a lot of you are very familiar with. And magic became my way to associate myself with the outside world because at the time I wasn't able to speak any English at all. As I'm developing my performance skill, I feel like I hit an obstacle. Because I feel like it's really hard for me to emphasize my character on stage. And then I saw someone perform. He was exactly the opposite of the way I was. My character is more of a wacky, outgoing, or uh, perform with audacity type of character. And he was the exact opposite. He was more like a gentleman, very laid back, very relaxed, charming. And so I asked him, would you like to work on a dual act together? And he said, no, that was the end of it. <laughs> Just kidding, he said yes. And that person is Matthew Stewart. Why don't you say hi to everyone, man? I was going to before you cut me off. Oh, I'm sorry, I did that on purpose though. <laughs> I'm Matt. Before I discovered magic, I wasn't very social. In fact, I was a very shy kid. That all changed the moment my mom realized I took a particular interest in a coin trick. Anyways, that's enough introduction. <laughs> Bottom line is, we both love magic. And together, we, overcome a lot of, we overcame a lot of obstacles. We found a lot of answers to our questions. And today, we're going to share one of these answers with you. The answer to this question, how to make a living doing what you love. Whenever we perform, people ask us a lot of questions like, Wow, you must need really big hands to do that. Or your fingers must need to be very nimble. The truth is, yes. <laughs> it does help, but it's not essential. OK. Yes, there are actually three aspects to this question. Uh, the first aspect is doing what you love hard. Um, as he mentioned earlier, having a big hand does help, but it's not essential. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you our friend, a world-class sleight of hand artist without hands, Maddie Gilbert. Unlike most of the other magicians out there, Maddie was born without hands. But through, that didn't stop him from pursuing his passion. He developed his own techniques, and lately he appeared on the new show, Fool Us, by Penn & Teller. And he actually managed to full plant teller. You guys can check out that video on YouTube. It's all over the internet. And that's just a picture of us with Penn and Teller. I call this picture Penn, Will, and Madden Teller. It's, it's cool to throw that out there. So being passionate about something can really help you drive towards your goal and overcome a lot of obstacles. But is having passion really enough? We have another story we'd like to share. And for the sake of the story, we'll just let the name of the person remain secret. We'll just call him Anonymous. Our friend was one of the best carditions in all of Canada. Not only was he a working professional, but he also dedicated a lot of his time helping younger magicians, helping them work on their skills and develop their crafts. You can imagine how shocked we were when one day he came to us and he told us, I want to quit magic. I said, why? Why would you want to do that? You spend your entire life working on your craft. He said, look, I'm 26. I don't have a decent place to live. I can't afford a vehicle. I can't afford a relationship. I'm broke. <laughs> and this is what magic has done for me. I've had enough. I want to quit magic. Needless to say, that was a heartbreaking moment for me, and that's when I swore to myself, I will never let something that I love become something that I regret doing. And it all comes down to having a good business sense. 
Yes, it all comes down to make a living. So I read, began to read a lot of business books, and, and that's when I learned the key concept of this is to understand the difference between customers and consumers. The customers are the people who are actually buying your product or service. The consumers are the people who are using it. So the customer in our case is, uh, for example, would be corporate event planners. The consumer would be the guests attending the corporate event planners events. They're both looking for different things, and we need to satisfy both of their needs. For the customers, they're more interested in our branding, promo videos, what we're wearing in our promo videos, testimonials. Whereas the consumers are more interested in interacting, laughing, and having a good time. So needless to say, we hit a lot of obstacles when we were trying to move into the corporate market and started trying to convince the uh, event planners that we're really entertaining. We're really good at what we do. We found a much better, better way to accomplish this goal after we work on our branding, packaging, and also, pro also professionalism. So now let's say we completely understand the needs of our customers and consumers. Yes, when, when it comes to making a living doing what you love, there's also the how aspect to it. And we want to introduce that aspect of it with a story about a one time in Las Vegas. Whenever we visit a new place, we always like to try and open up to that location by busking. Busking is essentially performing on the street for money. It's not the best way to make a living, but it is a great way to work on your skills and develop your craft presentations. While we're in Vegas, we find that it's really hard for us to grasp someone's attention. In magic, in busking, there's something called the draw, which is something that you do to draw people close. Once you have a small, small crowd, you can then work with that crowd and draw a bigger crowd. We, our draw is the Chinese thinking ring. Whenever we do the Chinese thinking ring in a city like Toronto, Ottawa, or Montreal, or Chicago, you would have a small crowd of people surround us by the end of the routine. But that was not the case in Vegas. At the end of the routine, people clap, then they quickly leave. We started to think it was almost impossible to keep people's attention with magic in Las Vegas. But that quickly changed. We had a friend we made in Vegas come up to us, and he said, let me try. I want to show you guys something. So our friend stands up on this platform. Before he's even done anything, people start to come up to him. He starts talking to them. Are you guys the magician? I mean, are you guys the audience? I'm the magician. Just by these small interactions, people started gathering in. Before he'd done any magic, he had a huge crowd of people. We were shocked. So he later explained the psychology behind what he was doing. He said, people in Vegas are tourists. They're expecting to see spectacles. They don't know what spectacle they're seeing, but they want to see spectacle. They want to go to MGM Grand. They want to go to Planet Hollywood. They want to see spectacle after spectacle. The thing about the Chinese thinking rain is that it's, it's too strong of a routine. At the end of that routine, people think that's the end of that spectacle. And that's why they want to quickly move on to something else. So the key to grasp people in Las Vegas' attention is to have that anticipation to make sure that they always expect something bigger is about to happen. So we modify the way we do our Chinese thinking ring routine. Instead of just doing it right away, I held two rings. And I say, ladies and gentlemen, this is the, one of the most classical pieces of conjuring in the history. This is known as the Chinese thinking ring. I spent my entire life perfecting this routine. But I don't feel like doing that today. Instead, I'm going to show you a coin trick and then people stay. They end up watching this whole show. And that just shows you this product that you develop doesn't really, really fit in all scenarios. This is, you're probably wondering how this ties into the how part. This is an example that your product always needs to be developing and evolving based on geographics, demographics, and the psychology of your customers. And this principle really, you see this principle everywhere in magic, whether you're performing uh, on the street or performing in the theater. In fact, we've done enough talking. Let's actually show you guys something. To start off, we're going to select a volunteer from the crowd, and we're going to select that volunteer by tossing this spike into the crowd. Whoa. 
we don't have the insurance. We don't have the insurance to that, man. I mean, we're gonna have to cover their medical bill. It's I was joking. <laughs> we're not gonna toss the spike into the crowd. What we're actually gonna do is we're gonna toss this paper ball in. Whoever it hits in the face first <laughs> will be our volunteer. It's much better at all than a spike, trust me. <laughs> all right, sir, okay. <laughs> Come up on stage. People will clap for you. Bring that paper ball as well. Could you please bring that paper ball? Toss it back. Great. Um, Right, My partner yeah. Will's gonna distract you for just a moment. Your name? Sumit. Sumit, nice to meet you. It doesn't really matter anyways. Oh, um, <laughs> so just look at the audience for a second. Okay, Sumit, I'm gonna explain what's going to happen. Basically, Matthew is going to mix up these bags. Okay. okay. Inside one of these four bags, there's a spike. And then you're gonna select the bag in a bit. But he's a mentalist. He's going to influence your decision with his language. Don't peek. Okay. <laughs> and whichever bag you select, he will place his hand over it and crush it. All right. So this could be dangerous. Right. And I'm just here to stall. I'm just here to delay this process. And uh, so what's your opinion on Donald Trump? That's a good sign I've stalled long enough. OK. <laughs> We're going to spread these out. There. So you're going to select from bag one, two, three, or four. Whichever bag you name, I'll place my hand over and crush. But before we begin, I just want to say, most good-looking people pick bag number one. Did you hear that, Submit? <laughs> good-looking people. <laughs> just, just saying. Smart people pick bag number two. Smart people, does that sound familiar, Smith? <laughs> Outgoing people pick bag number three. Outgoing people, people who are energized. And people like you tend to pick bag number four. People with all of the above traits. Yes, all of the above good qualities. So what would you like, one, two, three, or four? <laughs> I, I trust that guy. No, no, but this one's your decision. Oh, it's my decision, okay. I still trust that guy, four. Four actually means death in Mandarin. <laughs> Just saying. So you want four. I want four. So one, two, three, four. <laughs> You're not buying it, are you? You're sure it's not under bag number four? Positive. Positive, I like your confidence. <laughs> okay, by this time, some people in the audience, I'm not mentioning any names, John, May think somehow you're stooge. May think we purposely throw the ball towards you, right? Right, right, right. We're in it together, yeah. Yeah, they could think that. <laughs> so why don't you take this paper ball and just toss it anywhere. You know what, turn your back to the audience so that you can't see. Toss okay. it anywhere All right. in the audience. I'll get another person. Okay, yeah, that's you. Could you please, the lady over there, stop trying to hide away. Stand up. <laughs> yeah, that's you, stop looking around. Stand up. <laughs> Don't have to come up on stage, just stay where you are, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Just we have here three here. more bags. Two bags. One, two, and three. Whichever bag you select, he will place his hand over, and then crush. Um, two. two. Two? You're sure it's not under bag number two? Sure. <laughs> Your confidence is scaring me. Two more to go. One. One more to go. <laughs> That's right, one more to go, okay. Could you please just toss that paper ball to anywhere else? Doesn't really matter. Just as long as it's still in the theater. Okay, would you please stand up for everyone? And uh, we have here two more bags, one or three. This could three. be game changing. We'll offer you a chance to change your mind. You really oh. don't want to. Okay. I'm a little nervous about this one. Actually, Will, can you hold your hand out for me? Yeah, what's up? Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. That was a part two, of the deal. Are you sure about this? Three. Let's give a huge round of applause to all of our volunteers for not ending my career. Thank you so much. I tell and actually... Thank you. Can you just verify for everyone? Go ahead, tap that. You wouldn't want to slam your hand down on that, yeah, now, would yeah, you? Real, real. Let's give them a huge round of applause for helping us out. Thank you. It's a stupid way to make a living. <laughs> so this routine was actually originally developed by an England magician named John Allen. And we modified this 
And the first thing we changed was after the first spectator come up on stage, instead of having him select three bags, we only asked him to select one and then toss the paper ball into the audience to select the second spectator. But we find that through, through performances, by doing this, it changes the entire tempo of the routine. It adds to an actual layer to this piece. Because the moment when the spectator tossed the ball into the audience, everyone becomes part of the show. Because everyone could end up decide whether or not his career will be ruined. <laughs> There's and this, break, this really breaks the fourth wall. There's also another aspect we changed. Because we know this routine is very uncomfortable for some people because of the danger element. We wanted to add some humor in so at least everyone can enjoy it. Even if you're a little uncomfortable, at least you get a good laugh out of it. <laughs> My pain and suffering, yes. And so this combining theory and application, this in engineering science is known as praxis. And in other fields, this may no be known as product development. So let's look at the question again. How the hell really translates to engineering? And make a living really translates to having a good business sense. And doing what you love can essentially translate to passion. Because the key thing to this question is that you don't get to decide whether or not you can make a living doing what you love. The market does. And having a good business sense can, understand, can help you understand your role in the market. And having an engineering way of thinking can help you develop this product to fulfill that role. And even though this process can be painful, can be excruciating, it doesn't matter because at the end, you're passionate about it. So what's next? For us as performers, our business is limited by our time and energy. So the next reasonable step for us is to scale. And it is really difficult to scale as performers. But there has been a successful business model out there uh, that started in Canada and then turned into a multi-billion business. That company is called Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> you might have heard of it. Yeah, might have. Uh, and there's a big difference between Cirque du Soleil and Magic as a performance arts company because Cirque, Cir Cirque Act focused on the act, whereas uh, magic, M magic Act more, focuses more on the character. And this sort of segue into what, what we're, we're doing we're... next. <laughs> we're actually collaborating with U, the, the U of T Magic Club to host a Grand Illusion show. And we've been working on this show for, for over two years now. The original idea we had was to raise the awareness and educate the general public about the inventors behind these illusions. When you hear a great music piece, you probably know whether it's by uh, Mozart or Beethoven. If you see a great painting, you probably know the author. But that's not the case with magic. If I were to ask you, who was the inventor for the trick Metamorphosis, where a person is locked inside the trunk and then switched with a person that's on top? You probably didn't know it was by a guy named John Naval Masculine, a later popularized by, uh, by a little known guy named um... Harry Houdini. So hopefully, this can help, help even educate the general public a little bit about this knowledge behind the inventors for these illusions. So anyways, I think that's it, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I think everyone's still a little curious about the linking rings. Yeah, OK, the Chinese linking ring, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? Oh, sorry, guys, we're all the time, but we'll do it at the theater show, I promise. See you guys. Thank you Thank very you so much. much.